Good morning, I'm Rob McCoy, your guest pastor. <laughs> now it's good to be home. Bless y'all. Uh, thanks everybody. It was, uh, Michelle and I are happy to be home. Uh, we were in Korea and then we were in Oregon and Washington and Texas and I don't remember where. Um, but it was a tremendous trip and I'll tell you a little bit about that. But the folks who have the Bibles, I did this to you last time. Let's just pass them out now and then I'll go through the long introduction so you don't have to stand back there holding a stack. Of, I feel bad every time as I just watch you almost faint in the exhaustion. <laughs> if you don't have a Bible, raise your hand. They'll give you one. You're going to need it. We're going to be taking a look at John chapter two this morning. Uh, well, keep your hands up. They start, all, I don't know. They all do it differently. This side, he starts here and then goes back and just wants to give you exercise. Yeah. If you don't own a Bible, you're welcome to keep that one. It'll be the most valuable book you'll ever possess. Again, it's the only book in the world where you don't read it, it reads you. Yeah. It's living, it's breathing, it's sharpening a two-edged sword, it divides the thoughts and the intents of the heart. The greatest insult you can give me is say, Pastor, you make the Bible come alive. That is the lie from the pit of hell. The, the Bible is alive, it's living and breathing. You may come alive to the Bible, and I may too, but it's already alive, amen? So, and it's not the greatest insult, there are worse. I, but I just want you to know, I know you mean well when you say that, but it's like, go to Israel, makes the Bible come alive. No, it doesn't. It's already alive. So, it's an amazing, amazing book. All right. Well, we're all set. Um, it, it's going to be a bit of an introduction because it ties in with what we're going to be studying. But M Michelle and I, um, as, as a lot of you know, we were in Korea and it, it began uh, a young lady by the name of Mina Kim who uh, on her own dime came to the United States. Uh, she started a YouTube site where she was translating uh, honest American news into Korean because uh, in Korea they're, they're plagued with the same problem we have with uh, traditional media that uh, is globalist in its approach and just everyone repeats the same mantra as you listen to it and they just follow the same line. And they do that in Korea. And so she... Um, she was translating solid, truthful news into Korean, and her YouTube site exploded, just went nuts. And um, then she came over and she participated in, a, in America Fest and, and many of the Turning Point USA events, and she was moved and she wanted the same thing to happen in Korea with uh, youth in Korea. And so um, on her own, she ventured out to start what, what she called, um, uh, oh, Build Up Korea. Yeah, Build Up Korea. I was turning points in my head, but it's Build Up Korea. And, and she followed uh, everything in accordance with Turning Point USA. And um, she showed up here uh, and, and traveled to, to God speak on her own dime. She was on the East Coast. She came to two services. And then in the second service, she had courage to come up to me and ask me if I'd go to Korea. Uh, and I, I wanted to say no, but it came out yes. <laughs> I mean, yes. <laughs> and, uh, and, and so she was true to her word. I tried to get Charlie to come, but he's overwhelmed with travel. And so I went out there. And Michelle and I, you know, we were thrilled to go. Um, Michelle was supposed to go with a, a group to uh, Cambridge for the debates, Oxford. Um, and then that was canceled because the folks she was going to be traveling with would be doing the debates, which is the Kirks. Um, they ended up not going because Hamas and, and the death threats were pretty extensive. And the security team was like, this isn't healthy. And so Michelle got to go with me to Korea. And we got there, and it was unbelievable. I just have to tell you right now, the Korean people love America more than Americans do. Amen. Yeah, they're, they're remarkable people. Uh, they're grateful for the 36,624 uh, Americans that lost their life in Korea, establishing the 38th parallel, which north uh, of the 38th parallel is the poorest country on the face of the earth. Their people are starving to death. Even though with the armistice, they got all the farmland in the south, got all the mountains, uh, what the South got was freedom, and they have the eighth largest GDP, gross domestic production. They have the largest Christian population in Northern Asia, um, and they're the, the, some of the largest churches in the world. Uh, I actually went and met with a pastor, uh, Dr. Uh, Billy Kim, who's a pastor of the largest church in Korea, one of the largest churches in the world. He was a funny guy. He uh, it was it was a morning prayer breakfast, and he. We were there for a traditional uh, Korean breakfast, which is nothing like an American breakfast. I, <laughs> hard to get through, you know. No, it's delicious. <laughs> 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 
Oh, fish. <laughs> Often I have that for breakfast. <laughs> so, <laughs> really interesting. It's hard to continue. I feel sick. <laughs> but he, he met me and he said, uh, so what else do you do besides being the former mayor? I said, well, I'm pastor of Precious Congregation People. And, and he said, how large is your church? And I, I hate that comment. And I mumbled something. I was, well, this man is a pastor of a church of 300,000. I go, that's not a church. That's a city. <laughs> and all the pastors there giggled, you know, because they were like, that's their impression, like trying to impress one another. He said, did you vote for Trump? And I'd already heard kind of word. He, he was Billy Graham's guy. And, and he had been raised by an American GI after the war, uh, educated at Bob Jones University. He knows the, um, uh, oh gosh, they own Salem. Um, at, 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 at Singer, at Atzinger and Mona, that they, he, uh, he knows them. He went to school with them. Uh, he uh, knows John MacArthur, who went to Bob Jones. And he came to Korea and got connected with Billy Graham. His church exploded. Well, uh, he is very apolitical. Uh, he doesn't believe Christians should be involved in politics. He wasn't very supportive of Mina. And the only reason why I was invited is because one pastor who is a pastor of probably the third largest church in Korea, which is in the south. Uh, we went from Seoul to Busan, which was a long day's journey. It was exciting. <laughs> just drive all the way there, and then they, 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 they rode me like a rented mule. They, they had me everywhere. And it was, um, and it was it, you know, and then, you know, late nights, early mornings, late nights, early mornings. Uh, after a while, you're like, no. And then it comes out, yes. And I just... <laughs> Got to figure that out. But this pastor, Pastor Sohn, um, he didn't speak any English, but the two of us were knitted the minute we met. He's an amazing pastor. His church is hugantic. Um, and every Sunday, people show up at church, and it's an all-day event, and they serve every single congregant lunch. <laughs> Don't even think about it, all right? <laughs> it, it's, it, their dining hall is four stories. And, and he's walking around and he knows everyone's name. I'm like, I just, God, make two of him and none of me. That guy is amazing. And uh, I, 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 Michelle, that's right. I, I know her name. Um, <laughs> so so he, he was tremendous uh, and we, we got to become very close. He loved uh, sleight of hand, illusion, card tricks, coin tricks. I had him mesmerized. I taught him all my stuff and we became very close. So he invites me to come to this thing, and, and I, you know, it's, it's a big deal. Um, and I come as his guest. Well, Dr. Kim sees me there. He, he had to get my whole resume that Mina Kim had put in Korean and had sent in ahead so I could attend this breakfast with the notable bigwigs of Christendom. And uh, Dr. Kim says, um, did you vote for Trump? I go, yeah, I did. Are you going to vote for him again? I go, yeah, I am. He goes, well, yeah. <laughs> And, and he said, he said uh, why is this? I go, well, first of all, I'm not voting. I mean, you're probably alluding to the fact he's been three times married and twice divorced, and he's caustic in his tweets and everything else, and he's bombastic and egotistical. I, I said, I'm not voting for, for pastor-in-chief. I'm voting for commander-in-chief and the bodyguard of Western civilization. At which point all the other pastors are like, oh, yeah, and they're kind of stoked on it. And the one that he had pointed to that has not a church but a city, and the, the guy's, you know, he's really into it because he's charismatic and Billy Kim's kind of Presbyterian, uh, which means he'll be in heaven first because the dead in Christ rise first. And I, I, <laughs> I, I, my Presbyterian brothers get that. So, so as, as we were kind of, you know, having fun, he, 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 he I, I said, look, he reminds me of Samson. And I, you know, I said, name one moral thing about Samson's life. And I'm going through the comparison. And he goes, whoa, 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 whoa. And everyone's getting into it. And he goes, I didn't come here to talk about Trump. I go, I'm not talking about Trump. I'm talking about Samson. And they all laugh again. <laughs> I don't think I'm going to get invited back. But I, <laughs> we, we had some fun. It was, it was sweet. And then I, I connected with a lot of folks. And that was all a result of Pastor Son. And uh, I, I, this man invited me and, and he he was the one church that stood in defiance of the globalist lockdown during the scandemic, and I love this man for doing that. And I told him through Mina as she interpreted it, I said, I think we were separated at birth. My, my dad did come to Korea, 
Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, my, my dad wasn't a player. Back down. It was a joke, joke. And he laughed, but we became very close. And, and he, he put it out there to invite me. And um, we're going to do a lot of things together in the coming days. Well, the event itself that Mina put together was all her doing. And on her YouTube site, uh, she put it out there that she wanted to do this Build Up Korea. Over a thousand youth came, Korean youth. Um, and what was remarkable is the funding of it. Uh, you know, she's, a, she's an only child. Her father had a terrible accident. He's a quadriplegic. Um, she cares for her family. She's, her and her husband, Andrew, are precious. Her, her dear friend, Lucy, is sweet as a button. These two are, you know, nitro and glycerin. They're, they're, they're really doing a great work in Korea, single-handedly, these, these young ladies. And, and she got a, a text from uh, a man who happens to be the third in the hierarchy of the Samsung dynasty uh, in Korea. And they call him the Elon Musk of Korea because he's defied communism and stood in opposition uh, as a corporate lead, and, and the, the population loves this guy. And so he contacted Mina and said, I'll, I'll fund a large portion of this. And so she is a go-getter, and it was remarkable. We got to stay in his hotel, which is the Josun Palace, which um, is the nicest hotel uh, in, in Korea. And I, I, I tried to tell him I don't want to go home. I, I <laughs> uh, they, they were gracious and, and just precious. And watching what occurred and what's taking place, I have great hope. And I share this with you because a lot of folks are in despair and struggling over, you know, what we're seeing. And we're listening to the media and we're watching the news. We're seeing a war in Israel. We're watching, I mean, we just saw the uh, Chauvin got stabbed and killed. The the police officer in Minnesota, police officer who was um, put in jail for the death of George Floyd was now, he was put in general population, stabbed to death. We're watching all these terrible things occur and a lot of folks are losing heart. And I I just want you to know, as, as I was there, I was, I was blown away and so blessed by it. And then I come back here and Michelle and I head up to what is probably a more liberal state than California, which is Washington and Oregon. We were in Portland, then we jumped over the border into Washington. And, and I, I saw a group of people contending with the tyranny of both states and, and what Governor Mussolini did to us, Governor Isley did to them in Washington. And yet there is Heidi St. John, who's going to be speaking at the women's tea. She's a remarkable, amazing woman. And if, listen, ladies, if you haven't signed up, I don't know why. First of all, there's probably no more seats, but I'm just telling you that this lady is a powerhouse and she has started a homeschooling. It's kind of a hybrid co-op. It's, it's, it's flying under the radar and baffling the government in Washington. They don't know how to shut her down and they can't because it's so brilliant what she's done. And now she's going to start a college that's going to rival the community colleges and they're doing trades and teaching people HVAC and all kinds of stuff. And it's going to blow the schooling away up in Washington. In addition, she just dedicated a 70,000 square foot facility that's completely paid for. Uh, And this is all in the liberal state of Washington. And then uh, Sam Sandin and his wife Sharnessa invited Michelle and I because they're the assistant pastor of the Father's House, which is uh, in Washington. And they've been coming to the TPUSA uh, faith events and they've gotten, like, they, they're educated now and they get it. And Sam Sandin originally is from Sweden and he is, um, he's, he's now an American citizen and he, he loves this country and he is, he's involved everywhere. And his pastor, who's an older guy, he's a little bit older than me, so he's not that old. He's pretty young. And he, he, uh, he, he uh, I forgot what I was going to say. <laughs> but Sam has influenced Pastor Chuck. And, and Chuck was there. He invited me to come and speak. And Sam was just as brutal as Mina. I mean, they just rode me like a rented mule. I was up early and bed late and speaking everywhere. And it was like endless question and answer. And but that little church has made an enormous difference in that state and it is taking root and trust me, it is, it is going to be a powerhouse in this next election as a result of one man and one woman doing all that work. Now I share that with you because a lot of folks are in despair right now. Interest rates and inflation are crazy. There's no money left in the paycheck. We're wondering how to pay bills. We're besieged in the state of California, which is just overwhelming. Young people are looking at ways to get out of here. More people have left the state of California than came here during the Dust Bowl. And we're watching as it's becoming more and more oppressive. 
I mean, I, I'm, I'm want a gas. I, we were in Texas earlier in that time, and, and you know, Corpus Christi gas is like under three dollars a gallon, and we're here in California, it's approaching six. I was like, really? A dollar sixty-five is all taxes. It goes straight to the state. They didn't do anything but just sit there and put a gun and take your buck sixty-five while you're just trying to fill your tank to go to work. Which, when you get to work, they're going to take another chunk of it. And and they, and they what, what do we get for it? Good roads? No, no. You got to wear a kidney belt everywhere you drive. <laughs> so it's rough. And 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 yet, as overwhelming as it is. Take heart, we're watching the largest migration of 18 to 30 year olds moving towards a conservative mindset in America. Um, we're, we're making a difference. Uh, we're watching as pastors who were once kind of progressive and in opposition to what we stand for now. The ranks are swollen at 1,300 pastors coming to the San Diego event. We're watching as we're preparing others, and that's going to explode as well. We've got America Fest. We're, we're, we're watching churches come out in droves to participate in our event in Phoenix. And, um, you know, it's, it's very exciting. Now, you're not seeing it, but it's, it's always darkest before dawn. And it's easy to get discouraged. And take your eyes off the horizon and put your eyes on the Lord, the author and finisher of your faith. It says in Isaiah 6, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple with glory. It, two kings that were like Reagan-esque uh, had died, and everyone was in despair. But not Isaiah. His eyes were on the Lord, and he knew that God was still on the throne. God knows what he's doing and how to operate. People are in a time where they're starting to see the consequences of not standing for the truth and trusting people and having been lied to. I don't know if we have that meme, but this is in relation to uh, Black Friday. I don't know if any of you have participated, but it's a scam. Uh, Wednesday, it's $4.99. Hold. Thursday, $4.99. Hold. Black Friday, they slide $6.99. It's now $4.99. Go now. And you, you panic and you go buy something that was the same price on Wednesday and Thursday and you think you're getting a deal and you've been lied to. But they create an environment where you feel like you have to do this. And this is what they did with, with the injection. This is what they did with everything. They panicked you, they frightened you, they, they indoctrinated you, and, and now you're starting to realize, I don't trust them anymore. And there's a hunger that's starting to awaken in the general population of the, of the country of, of truth. Now, to stand for the consequences of truth is difficult, but that's the idea that Christians will lead the way and others will follow as we contend for that. And, and don't, look, don't think that you're in the dark despair of the worst that has ever happened. You know, I... In the in the in the the spring of 1961, uh, the world was Russia's oyster. They dominated. In, in 1957, I believe it was, they sent the first satellite into space, devastated the Americans. In uh, what was it? 1961, they had um, a diminutive Russian. His name was Yuri Gagarin, five foot two. First astronaut into space. America was way behind. And they were watching as the Soviet Union was progressing and all these challenges and dominating the world scene. And then we had Major Francis Gary Powers on May 1st, 1960, flying a U-2 spy plane from Afghanistan, Norway, going over Russia, taking high-level photographs at 70,000 feet. The U-2 plane was... Fuselage was light to travel at higher altitudes, and if it would be struck, it would completely just, de just, just destroy it. It wouldn't survive, leaving no trace for the enemy to get any idea of how or who it belonged to. And our intelligence said that nothing could shoot down uh, the U-2 at 70,000 feet, especially a MiG-15. But the MiG shot and, and the weapon exploded and it didn't hit the U-2 directly, but it was enough of an explosion like flak that it caused the U-2 to start to descend rapidly in a nosedive. Well, Major Powers was tangled in his oxygen tube, which was connected to basically a spacesuit because he was such a high altitude. And he's able to untangle himself and then eject out of the U-2 before it disintegrates. Um, and he has, breaks the record for the highest parachuting. I think he was at 17,000 feet when he began to descend and survived. Well, they didn't have any way to communicate and they thought that the plane had been destroyed. They lost it on the radar. 
And so the U.S. began to deny it around the world that, no, we don't know what you're, nothing like that ever existed. And then the next thing they know, they're bringing Francis Powers out in front of the world to see, and America was humiliated. So were his allies, Afghanistan, or excuse me, Pakistan, Norway. And uh, we realized we were just getting beat by the Soviets. And then they come in and they, 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 they take over Cuba and begin to bring in nuclear weapons. And the world is on the brink of war. We're losing at everything. It wouldn't be till many years later that Alan Shepard would do a suborbital flight, would last all of 15 minutes before John Glenn would orbit the earth. The U.S. was in second place in almost every category and they were plummeting. And a lot of trouble lay ahead. The Soviet Union, as the immigration from East Germany into West Germany was about 125,000 East Berliners would move from east to west the year before that East Germany puts up an, a massive wall and their soldiers don't point the gun at West Germany fearing an invasion. They point the weapons at their own people to stop them from leaving. And they basically create a prison dividing Europe, east and west. They seem to be in control. And then we go into Vietnam. The trouble lay ahead for us there. We have the Detroit riots, 1968 Democrat convention with the riots there. Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. shot. John F. Kennedy shot in 64. Bobby Kennedy in 68. We have Watergate. Then we get Carter. Double digit interest rates. A mortgage interest rate during Carter's years, 18.4%. So quit whining about the 8% right now. <laughs> Biden can... There's room for worse, which hard to imagine, but there is. There is. And it's at this point where Reagan steps up. He's a Hollywood actor. He'd been president of the Screen Actors Guild, I think it was. He had been a Democrat most of his life. It was asked by one of the interviewers, you've been a Democrat, but yet you blame the Democrats. And he says, I take blame for all that's happened because I once was a Democrat. You know, this is a joke where he just said, I... I I can't believe I was a Democrat, meaning he, he starts to understand the power of capitalism. He'd gotten an education. It's a book that's worth reading. It's called The Education of Ronald Reagan, where the president of General Electric had sent him to go around to stop unionization of many of these plants. And he started to understand free market economics, and he started to read, and he, he was brilliant. He, was, he, he didn't use planes. He'd go on a, on a train, and he would read, had thick Coke bottle glasses, and how many people realize that? He was a great orator. He understood the power of words, and he awakened America's entrepreneurial spirit as he became president after Carter. And I remember Carter with the 18.2% or 18.4% interest rates on mortgages and, and inflation going through the roof and gas stations closed, and he would come on, and I remember this vividly, he'd come on the air and he'd say, you know, turn down your thermostat and put on a sweater, and I thought, how depressing. It's like Mr. Rogers is running the country, and it just is awful. And, and Reagan becomes president after the Iranian, you know, hostage crisis and the helicopters crashing in the desert. Reagan steps in and, and all of a sudden overnight all the gas stations are lit up and the nation starts to awaken and it's morning in America again. He reduces unemployment from 11% to 5%. He, um, he brings the tax rate from 70%, 70% down to 28%. It's, it's freedom in America again. Freedom is having choices. He creates a series of choices and America awakens and starts to change. I remember witnessing this and it was exciting. And that was different than the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union in 1987 had their May Day parade and Reagan had stood at the wall and he said, Gorbachev, tear down this wall. And he stands in opposition to the Soviet Union. He won't budge at all. He contends and calls them the evil empire. He stands in opposition to them. And they featured on the May Day Parade in Moscow in 1987, I love this, it was meant to celebrate the success of communism, featured a group of laborers near the very end of the procession carrying a sign reading, marching 70 years to nowhere. Their people got it. They've been lied to for 70 years. And two years later, in November of 89, the Berlin Wall fell. Germany was reunited. Two years after that, 1991, saw the complete dissolution of what had been the largest empire the world had ever known, the Soviet Union. And the Soviet Union was no more. And America was as prosperous as it had ever been. And the reason why I share all this with you is because it's always darkest before the dawn. Don't despair. 
I, I, I share one more story, but before I do, I want to read this to you. In the dark early days of the Second World War, Churchill had few real weapons. He attacked with words instead. The speeches he delivered then are among the most powerful ever given in the English language. His words were defiant, heroic, and human. Lightened by flashes of humor, they reached out to everyone in Britain across Nazi-occupied Europe and throughout the world. As journalist Beverly Nichols wrote, he took the English language and sent it into battle. He led a, a besieged and beleaguered nation and dying world to fight the onslaught of Nazism. He bombed the daylights out of Germany. And yet, Neville Chamberlain was prime minister prior to Churchill stepping in. And under Neville Chamberlain, who dominated the press at the time and controlled all of the, the stories and had his, his knee on the neck of every parliamentarian because he, he dominated the parliament. Hitler takes the Sudetenland and justifies it by saying, well, they were German-speaking and their heritage is German. And Neville Chamberlain concedes that and comes back and says, we've achieved peace in our time. At which point, shortly after that, Hitler enters into Czechoslovakia and Poland and they realize Hitler's a liar. Shocking. <laughs> Neville Chamberlain, who's riddled with cancer and dying, steps aside, steps down, and at that moment, Churchill, who had been relegated to the back benches of Parliament because of the Dardanellis and Gallipoli, and he was such an orator and, and a debater that they, they didn't want to contend with his wit, and so they, they, they put him in the back benches of Parliament. But when they were at a most critical juncture where they hadn't prepared for the invasion of Germany into Britain, they were ill-prepared for war they broke the glass and brought Churchill forward because he had been decrying Hitler as evil and that he needed to be contended with and he spoke of good and evil. He, he used Christian terms. He was a Christian, the woman who raised him. When, he, when Churchill died, he had one picture by his bedside. It was Mrs. Everett. Mrs. Everett was his nanny. He called her womb. She took him and trained him in Bible verses that he would win every competition by memorization of these verses that guided him to defend and protect the Western world. He understood Judeo-Christian ideas. He understood evil, he understood good. And with the power of words, in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, the word was God, the word became flesh and dwelt with man. He understood the power of truth, and he stood. He stood in opposition to deception and lies. And he led a nation, and, and he would give speeches, and all he possessed was words. He had no physical weaponry to speak of. But they'd be moved. Goering, who was in charge of the German Air Force, had convinced Hitler not to do a land invasion of Britain, but he could dominate by an air war, which has never been successful, and that bought Britain more time, and the RAF held off the Luftwaffe. And Churchill was able to bring the troops back from Dunkirk, reassemble, and continue a war, pleaded with Roosevelt to enter on their side and on December 7th, 1941, when ja Japan attacked Pearl Harbor, that's when America entered the war and took on a two-fronted war against two fascist nations, Germany and Japan, and that's when Churchill turned to his cabinet and said, the war's over. And he said, how can the war be over? We've just begun. He says, it's not the beginning nor is it the end, but it's the beginning of the end. America has entered and this war is already decided. And that was the darkest moments, but he was a man of vision and understood how things operate. And I just want you to know, as I travel the country, I see so many amazing things occurring all throughout the land. Geert Wilders just won an, an overwhelming victory in the Netherlands. He's been dubbed the Holland's Trump. The entire Dutch establishment is in a gas over that. Italy's Prime Minister, Giorgia Maloney, is Italy's Trump. Prime Minister of Hungary, Viktor Orban, is apparently Hungary's Trump. Bureaucrats in Brussels are aghast at that. And here's my favorite, even more surprisingly, chainsaw-wielding Javier Malay is Argentini, Argentina's new president. And he's declaring, make Argentina great again. So it's kind of an interesting concept. Now, look, Trump's not my savior. But the Bible says... 
that Jesus declares upon this rock, Peter, your testimony, upon this rock, I'll build my public square, my city hall. And the gates of hell that enslave will not prevail. People will have freedom. They'll have life and life more abundant. They'll understand the law in accordance with Galatians 3, that it's a school teacher, guardian, to point people to Christ until faith comes. We'll establish cultures and dynamics where people will be pointed to Christ because truth will prevail. And the general citizenry, though they may not know God, they will understand that they've been lied to. And they understand that there is significance in truth. But they will only know that truth that those who profess to be committed to the truth, that Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. He didn't say, I am a way. He said, I am no other. He was very specific. I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. Every religion leads to God, but only one leads to heaven. And Jesus is that way. How is that possible? Because his death on the cross covered the multitude of our sins that when we receive his sacrifice, we're cleansed from all unrighteousness and we're reconciled to the Father and our names are written in the Lamb's book of life. As Christians, we're born twice, we only die once. And that death is just, we fall asleep and we awaken in the image of Christ. We, we don't die, we begin to truly live. Amen. For those who don't know the Lord, you will die twice, but you'll only live once. And that second death is awful. I wouldn't wish it on my worst enemy. Everything that heaven is, hell isn't. And everything that hell is, heaven isn't. I want you to take the worst things in the world, remove any goodness, and that's hell. You're not gonna party with your friends. It'll be awful. You're separated from a God of love and a God of goodness. You're placed in a realm where the worm never dies. There's sadness and sorrow weeping and gnashing of teeth. Why? Because we've decided to stand before God in our supposed own righteousness, to tell him we're good when in me, that is in my flesh dwells no good thing. You see, we're lying to ourselves, and, and that doesn't help with the truth. You're not good. Well, let me correct that. You're good compared to me, but I'm not the standard. God is. And thus there are none righteous. No, not one. That standard is unapproachable. The only way to get there is to have God cover you. You see, sin, which is a word people hate because no one wants to be told they're wrong. Sin is an archer's term. Here's the bullseye and here's where the arrow lands. It's called the sin distance in archery. How far you've fallen from perfection. The beauty about Christianity, every other religion is trying to hit the bullseye. It will never hit it. There's nobody perfect. And if you think you're perfect, you're egotistical and you've missed Christianity is different because what the Lord does is he moves the bullseye to where the arrow is. He imputes, he puts on your account his righteousness. He paid the penalty. He's just and merciful. Just in that he, the wages of sin is death, he died. That's why the water represents the grave. Death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. You become a Christian by receiving that gift of salvation. And what baptism is, is a public profession of faith. It's an outward it's an outward expression of an inward commitment. You're associating yourself with the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. It's no longer I who live, it's Christ who lives in me. You're a new creature in Christ. It's, it's an amazing expression of faith. Powerful and profound. Overcoming the law of sin and death by the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. No religion in the world offers that. And religion is relongari, how to relink with God. It's not a bad thing. I believe in religion. But there's only one religion that can reconnect you with God. Jesus is the way, Jesus is the truth, Jesus is the life, he and no other, it's exclusive. You say, well, that's narrow, truth is narrow, two plus two is four, I don't care if you're a social progressive and you wanna say, well, I feel, feelings are stupid in relation to that. I don't feel like gravity exists, you die if you run off a cliff, it doesn't matter how you feel. Jesus is the truth, and that's the declaration. What is gonna happen to you when you die? And that's the whole picture. You see, the world is caught in this, this cosmic battle for your soul. There are two forces at work here. One is mankind that wants to justify their sin and lie. Lie to themselves and lie to each other and lie to their enemies and lie to their friends. There's more than two genders, blah, blah, blah. You can switch genders, blah, blah, blah. It's not a baby, blah, blah, blah. It's a blob of tissue, blah, blah, blah. That's a lie. But you double down on that and you demand adherence. There's no freedom in that because then you prosecute people who are in opposition to you. There's no freedom in that. It just becomes another oligarchy. 
It's fascinating to me that we have the LGBTQ and then all the other letters to the alphabet defending the Palestinians. And if they were there, they'd be thrown off the tallest buildings. There are no tall buildings left, but they would be throwing them <laughs> off those buildings. I'm not saying that Israel is completely 100% right. They failed. They bombed the, one of the, the oldest Christian church in Christendom. How could they? It's, it's upsetting me. However, they have been invaded and they have the right to defend their territory. We've covered this. We come to a place where the world is in a cosmic battle for your soul. Choose this day whom you'll serve. And as for me, and my house will serve the Lord. But I have to tell you, this all began in Genesis chapter 3. A failure. Sin entered the world. And then there was a consequence to that sin. Sin is disobedience to God. Man was separated from God. There was a consequence to it that was listed in Genesis 3 that we'll cover momentarily. But before we do... I want to pick up one of my favorite passages for Christmas. And it happens and begins in John chapter 2, verse 1. Usually we stand for the reading of the word of the Lord. I want you to stand in your heart but sit physically. And the reason why is I'm limited on time because we've got baptisms to do. And that was a very long introduction. God forgive me. <laughs> on the third day, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee. And the mother of Jesus was there. Now both Jesus and his disciples were invited to the wedding. And when they ran out of wine, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. Jesus said to her, woman, if I said that to my mother, I'd be picking up my teeth with my broken arm. Woman, what does your concern have to do with me? My hour's not yet come. His mother said to the servants, whatever he says to you, do it. Now there were set there six water pots of stone according to the manner of purification of the Jews containing 20 or 30 gallons apiece. Jesus said to them, fill the water pots with water. And they filled them up to the brim. They weren't just obedient. They were obedient to the absolute highest degree. That's what God calls of you, your servants. You want to be great in the kingdom of God? Be a servant of all. When he tells you to do something, do it to the highest degree. Don't weary, go weary in well-doing. They filled them to the brim, verse 8. He said to them, draw some out now and take it to the master of the feast. And they took it. And when the master of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine, he did not know where it came from. But the servants who had drawn the water knew. You know, that's special that when you serve the Lord as a servant, you get to see the miracles. But I'll tell you what, you also have the greatest risk because you're putting it out there. Imagine them pouring water into the master's thing. He, they'd be beaten. And he filled it to the brim and they poured it and it turned wine and they got to witness this miracle and they were the only ones in the room who knew that. And the master of the feast called the bridegroom and said to him, every man at the beginning sets out good wine and when the guests have drunk, well drunk, the inferior, you have kept the good wine until now. Now I share this with you because it was profound in what it did. You see in verse 11, the beginning of signs Jesus did in Cain of Galilee and manifest his glory and his disciples believed in him. This is the turning point. The switches start to flip in the opposite direction. And Zebulun and Naphtali, in the darkest place in the earth, in the darkest season of the year, great light has shone. You see, I don't believe Jesus was born on December 25th. It doesn't make any sense, especially if you follow Elizabeth and Zechariah and the in the season of Abijah, which is his priestly calling, and there was a cycle there, and that's when the Lord told him that his wife would be pregnant with John the Baptist, and then six months later, Jesus would be conceived in Mary's womb, and she would say in the Magnificat in Luke 2 and Luke 1, let it be to me according to what you say, and that's where there was conception. And as you count backwards nine months, it puts the conception of Jesus at December 25th. That's why he's called Emmanuel, God with us, tabernacled with us. He takes on the form of a human being in the smallest form, which is a zygote, a sperm and an egg and the zygote. You say, oh, that's a blob of tissue. No, it's not. It's a human being. It can't be anything else. It's not going to turn into a unicorn. <laughs> Life has begun and it continues. You can kill it. But don't lie to yourself and say it's a blob of tissue. Look, we've all been raised that abortion is a medical procedure. Some of you want to defend what you've done just because you feel guilty. Let it go. Just Look, the Bible says, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, forget what is behind, strive for what is ahead. There's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, but don't double down on it. Live for life. It's a baby. The, 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 the safest place should be the womb of a mother. We should honor life. You don't like that, but it's true. 
Truth is difficult sometimes to swallow when we've been eating lies. But it's true. Jesus uses a term that is shocking. Woman. I mean, seriously, anyone in the room. Have you said that to your mother? Woman. (laughs) Maybe as a kid you did and your dad beat you. Woman, what does your concern have to do with me? My hour is not not yet come. We find it in Genesis chapter 3, the same word. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed, and he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. This verse is the foundation of salvation history. Those who are getting baptized understand salvation. This is the verse of salvation history. Hmm. It's powerful. The three players in this are Jesus Christ, the woman, and the serpent. Note that the woman in Genesis 3.15 is not named Eve until after God's judgment is pronounced in Genesis 3.15, making the word woman significant throughout the rest of Scripture. And we see the significance in the lives of both Jael and Mary. The woman mentioned in Genesis 3.15 is not Eve, but another woman, Mary. There are two teams, and we're contending for the soul of humanity Adam and Eve, by whom sin came into the world, and the second team is Jesus and Mary, by whom sin is defeated. Now, a great sign, this is Revelation 12, 1. It's one of my favorite Christmas stories. Some of you going, Christmas and Revelation? Yeah. It's really creepy, but it's cool. <laughs> now, a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a garland of 12 stars. Then being with child, she cried out in labor and pain to give birth. Another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great fiery red dragon having seven heads and ten horns and seven diadems on his head. His tail drew a third of the stars of heaven. Those are demons. They were angels. And there's a third. Two thirds still remain because we are on the winning team. They threw them to earth and the dragon stood before the woman who was ready to give birth to devour her child. As soon as it was born, she bore a male child who was to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up to God and his throne. Revelation 12, 1 through 5 shows Mary as the woman again. The woman in Revelation 12 is not a type of global church as Protestants teach because the male child birthed in 12, 5 is Jesus Christ and we know that the church did not birth Jesus. Jesus' mother is Mary, Luke 12, or excuse me, Luke 1, 26 to 2, 52. Luke's emphasis is Mary, Matthew 1, 23, Luke 1, 35, Galatians 4, 4. Also note that Revelation 12, 7 9 clearly shows the dragon as the ancient serpent who is called the devil and Satan. Elizabeth, filled with the Holy Spirit, exclaimed that Mary is the mother of my Lord. That's Luke 1, 43. We know that the male child is Jesus because he will rule the nations with a rod of iron. And so this means Mary is the woman of Revelation 12. Now keep in mind that Jesus and Mary are on the same team for crushing the head of the serpent. In Judges 4, 17 to 22, we see Jael crushing the head of the enemies of Israel by driving a tent stake into the head of the Canaanite general Sisera. Cool story. Don't know if we can teach it in Sunday school, but it's a lot of fun. (laughs) Notice that in Judges 5, 24, that Jael is praised in the same manner as Mary uh, by the angel Gabriel in Luke 1, 42. Jael is a type of Mary foreshadowing the crushing of the head of the serpent as prophesied by God in Genesis 3.15. And we see a similar picture in Judges 9, 50 to 55, when a certain woman drops an upper millstone on the head of King Abimelech, crushing his head. And notice it did not name the woman in Judges 9.50 because Eve wasn't named until after the fall in Genesis 3.20. The praise of Jael points to Elizabeth's praise of Mary, Judges 5.24, bless, uh, most blessed of women be Jael. Luke 142, blessed are you among women. That's what Elizabeth said to Mary. In the Gospel of John, we see the fulfillment of these types of Mary in Mary. Jesus calls Mary woman, twice referring to Genesis 3.15. Jesus calling Mary woman may be for his hearers to recall the past victories of Israel's women. In John 2, Mary is present to initiate Jesus' earthly ministry. When she tells him that there is no more wine, he refers to his death when he says, my hour has not yet come. He says this because he is telling her that he If he does a miracle, as she requests, then this will ultimately lead to his death on the cross. She turns to the servant, saying, do whatever he tells you. The last words Mary is recorded essentially saying are, be obedient to Jesus Christ. Mary always points to Jesus. It's powerful. Almost finished. Again, he calls her woman at the wedding feast of Cana. Looking back at Genesis 3.15, he does it again at the cross. Notice that the bride and groom are not mentioned at the wedding feast of Cana. Rather, Jesus and Mary are mentioned by name. Jesus calls Mary woman from the cross because she is present in the crushing of the head of the serpent. Watch this. The words Calvary and Golgotha 
mean, the place of the skull. Again, Jesus calls Mary woman because she is present as the new Eve for the crushing of the head of the serpent. Satan strike at Jesus on the cross was a minor wound. You will strike his heel, but Satan suffered the wound of he will strike your head. After the fall of man, Adam named his wife Eve because she was the mother of all living, Genesis 3.20. If Adam named her, for, uh, named her Eve because she was the mother of all living after death entered the world through sin, then how much more Mary is the mother of all living after sin was conquered through the victory that she and her son Jesus Christ, the Son of God, brought to everyone who believes. That's a powerful picture of God redeeming something that we really screwed up. And there's two teams Choose this day whom you'll serve. There, there's a God or there isn't. And if there is, are you right with him? Oh, I can't believe you call him him. Really? That bothers you. 66 books of the Bible, cover to cover. You, you, you examine, I just finished reading uh, Eric Metaxas' book on the death of atheism. That everywhere they dig that the Bible says something exists, they find it. The Hittites were, were considered fable. And they dig where, they, and there it is. They, they see the cuneiform and they, they, they translate the, the writing. They start to realize, this is that civilization we said never existed. Oh, the city of David with myth, mythical. They found it now. Digging right where they said it was. Sodom and Gomorrah. Jericho. We can go on and on, and it's fascinating. There's, there's not a work of antiquity that's more reliable than the Bible itself. You can't, you can't judge a work of antiquity by the scientific method. You have to do it by cross-referencing and original manuscripts. There's not, I mean, the Dead Sea Scrolls, they find this in 1947 or 48, I guess, it was the birth of Israel. They, they find these things, and that, that's like, that's the title deed. And they've, they've got it in the Israeli museum. A shepherd boy finds it. In the lowest point on earth, where it's preserved by multiple lever, levels of, what is it called? Yeah, thanks. I didn't hear you, but I hope you heard them. <laughs> Atmosphere, thank you. Fascinating how God preserves this. The word. Truth. There is truth. You either honor it or you don't. You're either lying to yourself and everyone around you, or you recognize it in me that it's in my flesh dwells no good thing. I don't care how many times you swear that you'll never do it again. You know you've done it again. If, if New Year's resolutions really worked, you would all be magnificent. But look, it looks like the bar scene from Star Wars. Look, look at this. It's just, I'm kidding, kind of. <laughs> it's always darkest before dawn. Some of you are struggling. Financially, relationally, struggling with your kids, your spouse, yourself, work. It's dark and overwhelming. Yeah. In your weakness, God's strength is made perfect. Call on me, I'll show you great and mighty things you know not of. You either trust him or you don't. You're gonna either try to flesh this one out and do it on your own, but you know what? You haven't done so well at this point. God says, call on me. Use three words that the Syrophoenician woman with the demon-possessed daughter used that was very powerful. She said, Lord, help me. He did. Call on him. He'll call you to the end of yourself and he'll say, come and die with me that you might live. Come and be crucified that I might live through you. Die to your flesh, live to me. I'll take up residence in your life. I'll give you the ability to say no where it needs to be said and yes where it needs to be said. I'll lead you into all truth by my spirit. And if you want this, you have to be honest. Blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of God. You see, That's the loose dirt on top before you can get to the bedrock. You have to, you have to just say, God, this is, all, this is all me. It's just getting in the way. Let's get to the bedrock. I'm a sinner and I need a savior. 
I don't want a better me, I want a new me. And God will do it in those dark moments of your life. You'll overcome, Gary Powers still went on. America overcame. Yuri Gagarin is just a byword. And here we are in a dark season where it seems overwhelming and now I got a new president in Argentina. And the world is tired of getting lied to. We're waking up, but look, our savior's not coming on Air Force One. You want a better America? You want a better world? Start to cherish the truth and it begins with cherishing the author and the embodiment and the fullness of truth, which is Jesus. And come to him with all your trash and watch him make ashes into beauty. I'll tell you what, it's already a little murky. But you come in and by the end of today, that thing is gonna be a cesspool. Because you go in with your sin and you come out with Christ. I, I, I love it. Don't worry, you're not gonna get sick. We've chlorinated the snot out of that. Liter literally snot out of that. It's warm too. And I, and I say this because when folks go in there and they're making a public profession of faith, I want everybody in this room. The Bible says that one person repents, the angels in heaven rejoice. Don't you think if it's important for them to go nuts that it's important for us to go nuts? We're witnessing a miracle. Fill it to the brim. You're the servants. You get to see the miracle. And this is a result of folks standing for the truth. This little church here has made an impact not only across this country, but the world. And, and, and folks are coming to Christ and they're professing a public expression of faith that the world would know they're a follower of Jesus Christ and we are going to rejoice with them. And I, I'm gonna be baptized in this service. I won't do next, but I'm gonna do this one. And so um, I'm gonna ask you if you wanna get baptized, line up right now. Let's, let's get to it. Let me pray for you. Let's join me in prayer. Lord, thank you for your blessing. Thank you, Lord, for your word, which is true. You are the word, and you're true. And Lord, I ask that as folks come for baptism, that, Lord, this would be a day they'd never forget as they associate themselves with the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, that they're new creatures in Christ, that they go into the water and they come out realizing, I am a follower and I want the world to know that Jesus is my Savior. And they're being obedient. And Lord Jesus, you say, if you love me, you'll obey me. And you, you command us to be baptized. You say, repent and be baptized. And so, Lord, today we come. Bless these folks, Lord, please. Give them a supernatural love for your word and a heart to proclaim it. And let them realize that this day as they look back, it's a day they'll never forget as long as they live. We ask your blessing now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Can we get this out? Can we get someone to move the podium?
Savior be upon you and a thousand generations and your family and your children and their children and their children may his favor be upon you and a thousand generations and your family and your children and their children and their children may his favor be upon you a thousand generations and your family and your children and their children and their children may his presence go before you and behind you and beside you all around you and within you he's with you in the morning in the evening in your cup
my God, that is who you are. Cause you are the way maker, miracle work, promise keep, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Oh, you are the way maker, miracle work, promise keep, light in the darkness, my God. That is who you are. 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 Even when I don't see it, you work. And even when I don't feel it, you work. You never stop. You never stop working. Never stop, you never stop working. And even when I don't see it, you work. And even when I don't feel it, you work. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. And even when I don't see it, you work. And even when I don't feel it, you work. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop. Way maker, miracle work, promise keep light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. Cause you are the way maker, miracle work, promise keep light in the darkness. My God, that is who.
love and the faith And all my life you have been so, so good
Amen. Let's pray. Jesus, Lord, we thank you for, Lord, the lives declared to be followers of you. Lord, Lord, and as we were singing these songs, oh God, my God, I need you. This is that declaration that we need you, God. We cannot go on without you. We cannot picture our lives without you. Lord, a fruitless life. Lord, we thank you for all of the hearts that have been declared followers of you. Lord, we thank you. We love you. We praise you. We rejoice with the angels in heaven. In your mighty name, amen.